Hey everyone, it's Colin, how's it going? Just kind of a quick casual video for you this time. Wanted to check out a new laptop for my retro collection. And this one is a little bit different than I was expecting. This is a Sony VAIO model PCG SRX87. It dates back to the early 2000s and you can tell it's a fairly small machine. You know, like my hand for scale, this is definitely a sub notebook. But early 2000s, you're initially gonna think, okay, well maybe it was a netbook. This thing is not really a netbook though, and let's take a look at why. The first thing is its selection of ports. This thing has a few ports on it and connections that were very different than the inexpensive, cheap, you know, low-end netbooks that we're used to from the mid-2000s. On this side, you've got audio in and out, of course, USB, and then also a memory stick slot. I mean, this is a Sony product, so of course they're gonna, they're gonna try to promote their own media format. And then on the left side, we've got the wireless on off switch, a PC card slot, and then built in 10 100 Ethernet hiding behind this flap. And up front, there's a 56K modem also behind a flap. And then, well, behind this door is where this machine gets very Sony like. There's a proprietary video out connector, and I don't think Sony necessarily wanted that connector to be proprietary, but it was just kind of forced because of how small the computer is and how relatively few areas there are for large connectors. And then there's a Firewire 400 port, of course Sony called it iLink. Firewire as a standard had the ability to carry voltage to power an external device from the host computer, but the four pin version couldn't do that. It was data only. So Sony came out with this separate connector and in some cases it was a separate cable that would supply that voltage. Why Sony didn't just put a six pin Firewire port on the computer, I'm not quite sure. Maybe it was just so they could standardize because they used the four pin on like everything else. But the big bummer is while you can hook up external power devices like optical drives to this machine, you have to do so using that second proprietary power connector. While I've got plenty of four pin firewire cables because that was a standard, uh, that power connector isn't and unfortunately I'm lacking that cable. The screen latch on this machine is interesting too in that typically, normally when you close the display, it latches itself close and you press a spring loaded thing in order to freely open it up again. But this one, it's different. There's this lock release switch. When it's in release, you can just open the display freely. No, no problems. And then you flip it over to lock to keep it closed. I'm not sure why Sony went this way instead of the spring loaded thing, but it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, the only other thing on the outside of this machine is just the power switch. And it's one of those momentary sliders. So being a sub notebook, obviously the keyboard's gonna be a little bit smaller than usual. It's like every key is kind of just shrunken down a little bit, they're a little more compact. But while that takes a little bit of getting used to with just, you know, how smaller everything is, the key feel itself is excellent. The board is reasonably stiff. It doesn't, you know, feel loose or springy or anything. The keys have a decently clicky feel, but they're not overly firm. It's actually a pretty decent experience. Also, the thing that got me is how reasonably large the touchpad is compared to the rest of the machine. Big touchpads on computers weren't really becoming a thing until later on in the 2000s. So Sony was kind of thinking ahead with putting a big pointing device on here. And I also like this feature down here. Sony knew this computer was gonna be used heavily for internet browsing and, and you know, kind of casual use like that. And because touchpads didn't have multi-touch support at this time, the whole, you know, two finger scrolling, that sort of thing, they wanted to make it convenient otherwise to surf the internet. So there's a built-in scroll wheel and a built-in back button for your web browser. And they actually work pretty well. The scroll wheel is notchy. It's got a little bit kind of a clicky feel to it. It does take a little bit of getting used to because it's plastic and not rubberized. If it was a little bit easier to turn, I think that would be a bit more convenient. Sometimes your finger just kind of slips off it because it's a hard plastic. 
but otherwise that's a really neat way to have arranged all of this you know just kind of tucked inside the left and right mouse buttons so while at first glance this thing does look a lot like the netbooks that we became familiar with in the mid 2000s and onward it's a smaller size you know meant to be more convenient to carry around relatively limited selection of ports that sort of thing battery life was actually fairly decent Sony rated it between two and a half and six and a half hours. I'm not sure how they came up with those figures, but I'm guessing in real life you were probably somewhere in the middle. But this really was from the pre-netbook era. This was a proper sub-notebook, and there are a few features that kind of put it in that more premium category. The first is that it's got a 10-inch LCD screen, and that one's a high resolution panel, 1024 by 768. A lot of the netbooks went for smaller, less expensive screens, lower quality, lower resolution. You get a decent amount of real estate on this one, 1024 by 768 XGA. That was a common resolution on larger laptops at the time as well. So Sony didn't really cheap out on the display. Also the performance. Instead of an Atom or Celeron CPU, Sony went with a mobile Pentium 3 processor. It's clocked at 850 megahertz. That doesn't sound like a whole lot, but it actually performs quite well. As the machine was designed to run Windows XP, and in general usage, it's actually quite smooth. RAM is fairly limited in this computer. It shipped with 250 megabytes and the maximum is only 384. It used these unfortunately uncommon or small form factor, I guess you can say, laptop dims. They were even smaller than the typical ones. So trying to find larger modules is not terribly easy or convenient, at least not at the time. But overall, the machine actually performed quite decently. It had a 20 gigabyte hard drive, and that was a standard two and a half inch drive. It just comes out from a little trap door on the bottom. So that's easy to upgrade or replace when necessary. The other big thing about this machine is that it shipped with built-in Wi-Fi. In the early 2000s, while that technology was fairly new and gaining rapid adoption, it still wasn't terribly common. And so a lot of people buying laptops who wanted to add Wi-Fi needed to put in a card, usually a PC card in the side of the machine. But this one came with it built in. That was a big deal at the time. And I think that also helped kind of push this machine to be perceived as a bit more of a premium product instead of just some cheap home use, you know, inexpensive device just for puttering around on the internet. Something I do with every new to me retro computer is I wipe the hard drive and reinstall the operating system. I just don't want to deal with whatever data was already on there. I want to start clean. This being a Sony VAIO though, well, it's a little bit harder than it should be. Specifically, it comes down to finding and downloading the drivers. It is still possible to do so, but it's just, it's a massive pain to try and dig up everything that you'd need for a specific model. Unfortunately, this machine didn't come with a recovery partition or the original restore CDs. And sadly, I couldn't find images of the restore CDs online anywhere either. If you have one of these, it's model PCG SRX87. If you've got either the original recovery partition or those discs, please, please, please upload them to the internet archive, archive.org. That way other people can benefit as well. And frankly, that just goes for any Sony VAIO computer. If you've got recovery disks for any VAIO model, please just upload a copy of them because it really helps a lot of people out. It's, it's a massive pain trying to find the drivers otherwise. I did a video all about it when I worked on a VAIO desktop and I kind of go into the details of it then. But I wanted to try and get ahead of myself with this one. So I did a little bit of digging in the Windows directory on the hard drive. I figured, you know, maybe I can extract the driver file somehow. And I totally lucked out. Not only did I find all the original VAIO wallpaper images just sitting right there in C Windows, but I also found a folder full of all the driver files. I don't know if like the original owner copied them in there for safekeeping or if Sony just did that by default, but it looked like everything I needed was there. So I made a backup copy of all of that. To reinstall Windows, I used an external Firewire optical drive. I actually bought it for use with another Sony laptop that we'll, we'll take a look at another day, but it worked great. I did have to use a separate power adapter for it because I'm missing that whole, you know, special power cable that goes along with the Firewire. 
But otherwise, the computer was able to boot off of it, off the Windows XP CD. I got XP reinstalled, no problem. And then I figured, okay, it's gonna take a little while to get all the drivers reinstalled. I was really surprised. This VIO is nothing like any other VIO that I've worked on. Windows XP Service Pack 3 had almost all of the drivers this machine needed right off the bat. The only two drivers it was missing was for the wired networking and the modem. It had the graphics, it had the chipset, it had the audio, all the other stuff was just there and ready to go. It kind of blew my mind. So, you know what? If you're interested in getting into a Sony laptop for retro, you know, exploration purposes, this model is actually not a bad one to do it with just because it doesn't look like Sony did much in terms of proprietary hardware with it. There's really two bummers when it comes to this computer then. First is that while it's more powerful than a lot of the netbooks that came after it, it's still not super powerful. I wouldn't try to do like old school video editing or anything on it, even though it has a Firewire port and it can import media off of a memory stick. I mean, I've no doubt that Sony intended you to buy other parts of its ecosystem and hook them up and, you know, do photo editing and video and all that kind of stuff on here. I'm not sure I would try to push this thing too far. The other thing is the graphics aren't that great. It's just Intel integrated graphics. So gaming, uh, maybe DOS gaming would be fine, but I wouldn't get too much into Windows XP gaming on this machine. It really was meant to be for, let's just say, lighter weight tasks. And that's typically the case with these smaller computers. Portability just takes over the design decisions for everything and trying to extract maximum battery life kind of goes along with that. So putting really powerful integrated graphics or discrete graphics, well, that kind of runs counter to what this thing was intended to be. The other bummer is, well, they don't show up very often. I've been looking on and off for a while now for other ones of these on eBay or restore discs or accessories, anything like that and they just hardly show up. I don't think they were a very popular model, even though they were sold outside Japan. I mean, this is a standard US spec machine. If you wanna get one of these, unfortunately, they're kind of scarce, and because they're kind of scarce and VIO stuff is getting to be fairly, you know, collectible from a retro perspective, the prices aren't gonna be super low. But if you run across one of these in the wild at a recycling center or flea market or thrift store or whatever, Despite the fact that VIOs are known to be kind of a pain to work on and reformat and find drivers for, this one I think really is very much an exception and I'm happy to have it as part of my collection. If you like the video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. Be sure to subscribe. You can follow me on social media at thisdoesnotcomp. And as always, thanks for watching.